Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to talk on this session about the various monitoring devices that we all use in our daily practice. My name is Laura Galarza, and I'm an intensivist working in an ICU in Spain. Before we begin, I have to say that I have no conflicts of interest in this talk. The first time you ask for an hemodynamic monitoring in your unit, they likely gave you quite a long list to choose from. So which one is better for my patient? Should I use the same as my colleagues? Many questions will come to your mind, so you will probably go on the internet for some insight. In 2011, this clinical review was published. They made a review review of the advantages and limitations of its method to measure cardiac output. They also proposed trend principles to guide the choice for of hemodynamic monitoring systems and the key principle properties of an ideal hemodynamic monitoring system. In 2014, a task force from the European Society of Intensive Care published a consensus on circulatory shock and hemodynamic monitoring. They provided 44 statements on how to diagnose, treat, and monitor patients with shock. If we look at the statements related to monitoring, we will find, for instance, echocardiography as preferred modality to evaluate the type of shock and a recommendation for measuring cardiac output to evaluate response to fluids and inotropes in patients that are not responding to initial therapy. A couple of years later, this report on less invasive monitoring was released. It focused on describing the various minimally invasive and non-invasive techniques, and also provided us with this simplified algorithm for the choice of hemodynamic monitoring in patients with acute circulatory failure. But this paper was published some time ago. What is people do, using now for monitoring this patient? What has changed since 2016? In order to prepare for this session, I decided to do a poll on Twitter. And surprisingly, or maybe not, almost 64% prefer ultrasound to monitor this patient. Some could argue that these results are biased, and maybe they are, or maybe it's time to move forward. This result got me an idea. Almost everybody knows how arterial pulse control analysis works, but maybe not everyone knows how ultrasounds could do similar things and even more. So let's focus on ultrasound for hemodynamic monitoring and compare both methods at the end. When we want to assess the cardiovascular system, we should take a look not only at the pump and pipes, but also if there is any leak. And ultrasound can assess all these parts. If we start with the pump, a stroke volume can be measured using the diameter and the BTI of the left ventricle outflow tract. This article assesses the precision of various echo variables for BTI Averaging three measurement is enough in patients with sinus rind. They also assessed the least significant changes between different examinations. This systematic review and meta-analysis from 2019 showed that there was no significant difference between assessing cardiac output with echocardiography or thermodilution, that the optimal site for sampling with ultrasound are the aortic bulb and the left ventricle outflow tract, and in some special scenarios such as high cardiac output, low sedations, or patients with physiological structural changes, the accuracy of cardiac output measurement by echocardiography is questionable. Left ventricle ejection fraction can be estimated by a volume. This study showed that after six hours of training, Intensivists were able to estimate left ventricular function with reasonable accuracy. But there's other measurements that we can do. For instance, MAPSI is a useful surrogate of left ventricular ejection fraction. In this study, the rock analysis showed that a MAPSI cutoff point 
of more than 12.5 millimeters, diagnose normal of, or mildly reduced ejection fraction with high sensitivity and specificity. Estimating the left atrial pressure is a key component in the hemodynamic evaluation of the patient. For example, its presence may predict risk of cardiogenic pulmonary edema with volume resuscitation. Diastolic dysfunction in patients with sepsis occur with a prevalence of 20 to 57% and is associated with increased mortality. This is the guideline from the American and European societies of echocardiography. But from the intensivist point of view, we have some concerns about the practical application of the algorithm, given the challenge of time constraints, the clinical pressure, and the high prevalence of patient-specific factors that degrade image acquisition. That's why Lanzmann and colleagues studied it using the previous guidelines and proposed a simplified approach to create the diastolic dysfunction. Although these findings need to be replicated and studied with the new guidelines, there's a body of literature supporting the utility of E prime and E E prime ratio to the, in the assessment of diastolic function. In this article from San Filippo, they suggested us how to manage patients with left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. For years, the left ventricle has been considered as the essential one for maintaining effective circulation. But with advancing technology, the link between Gaetan's physiology and cardiovascular assessment demonstrated the role of the right ventricle. In septic shock, fluid overload is associated with worse outcome, and right ventricle is the main limiting factor of fluid responsiveness, as showed by Mahmoud and colleagues. In the evaluation of the right ventricle, echocardiography plays a key role. From basic measurements such as right ventricle size, right ventricle left ventricle ratio, TAPSI or ESC wave, to estimate pulmonary artery pressures. Right ventricle failure was recently defined in a consensus as a significant right ventricle dilatation with systemic congestion. This paper recently published wanted to report the incidence of this right ventricular failure and its impact on fluid responsiveness. They divided the sample into three groups, depending on the right ventricle left ventricle ratio and the CVP. The incidence of right ventricular failure was around 42%. For the fluid responsiveness, they conducted passive leg raising. Response to PLR was altered by right ventricle size. Patients with significant pulse pressure variation and right ventricle dilatation were less likely to respond. In this article, patients with right ventricle failure will respond to fluids in only 30% of cases. Preload is one of the determinants of stroke volume, and intensivists have been trying to assess it since long ago. Standard parameters such as this one are not useful in predicting fluid responsiveness, except maybe in patients with very low preload. For instance, an inferior vena cama of less than 10 millimeters or a very small and hyperkinetic left ventricle. To assess fluid responsiveness, the heart should be tested by transient modification of preload. This is affected during a fluid challenge or a PLR maneuver, and it can be predicted using the effects of mechanical ventilation on the systemic venous return. Respiratory cycle changes for our BTI. BTI changes during different maneuvers, such as the end expiratory occlusion text or the passive vertical raising, distensibility index of the inferior vena cava or collapsibility index of the superior vena cava, and also changes in the carotid and femoral Doppler flows can be used and has been used in many studies. This algorithm was proposed for assessing fluid responsiveness in this book and may be really useful in some scenarios. Afterload is classically represented by vascular resistance. But as you can see, this is just a derivative from the Holmes equation that can be easily obtained. 
What really fascinates me is the arterial elastans and the ventricular arterial coupling. The arterial elastans is another measurement of afterload, but explaining how this works will take for another lecture. And what is important is that it can be assessed using ultrasound as demonstrated by Chen and colleagues. Talking about leaks in our system, comet tail artifacts or beelines were first described in 1997 by Daniel Liechtenstein as an ultrasound sign of alveolar interstitial syndrome. Beelines are not always equal to congestion, but could also be found in fibrosis or inflammation. Long ultrasound scores have been proposed for the assessment of pulmonary edema, and they have shown to be highly correlated with extravascular lung water. Hemodynamic management has traditionally focused on maintaining adequate cardiac output and arterial blood pressure. However, organ perfusion is affected by other factors such as the venous pressure. Organ congestion is susceptible to occur in patients with fluid overload. Recently, an EVA score has been proposed based on the IBC di diameter and venous flow, the BEXUS score. Venous flows will be altered by the increase in central venous pressure. Articles validating this score in critical care had not been published yet, but it's a promising score and I'm sure they will be pretty soon. To finish, let's come back to our Twitter question and compare both methods, ultrasound and pulse control, calibrated or not, using the properties of an ideal hemodynamic monitoring system from the 2011 article. Both produce relevant, accurate, and interpretable data, are easy to use once you have the training. Pulse control monitor could take a while to have it running, while ultrasound is, if you had a new machine, readily available. Ultrasound is clearly operator dependent, but also calibration with illusion has some degree of dependency. Both have rapid response time and are able to guide therapy. Ultrasound causes nearly no harm, but pulse control requires minimum on arterial line. We can see that ultrasound is cheaper clearly and maybe cost-effective for pulse control. But one of the main inconvenience of ultrasound is that it's not continuous and it is for the pulse control. Uh, one of the advantages of ultrasound from the pulse control is that we can see directly the structures that we want to assess. So my Timmy home matrices are that you need to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each device and choose one or another depending on your patients. And sometimes you need to combine both or two methods. When you are dealing with an extremely ill patient, you don't have time to try a new device just the one that you are more used to. If you haven't used ultrasound in these scenarios, give it a try after having been trained for each measurement in a stable patient. So thank you very much for your time. Hope you had enjoyed this session. <laughs>